Hey guys, uh, Nirvana again with another Doom related video. Uh, this time I wanted to talk about monster rolls. Last time I talked about encounter design, um, and this kind of fits into that quite a lot. Uh, I did sort of touch on this a little bit in the video, which is sort of where I got inspired uh, to make a video about it because I think especially with like harder content and slaughter design and things like that it's certainly something that um uh it would be very beneficial for like newer mappers to learn about just how like the doom sandbox operates because um doom i think one of the reasons it's such a strong game is that uh the monster sandbox or weapon sandbox they interact in really interesting ways and the monsters are sort of uh, each one has a specific role in the sandbox, for the most part. And, uh, they fulfill different purposes when utilized. There's no real, like, uh, useless monsters in the cast. For, well, we'll touch on it a little bit, but for the most part, that's okay. So, I want to talk about each individual monster's role in combat, how to use monsters in encounters, and then I'll, I'll probably give a couple of specific examples. Uh, probably not for every single monster, but um, certainly with some of the main ones. And I want to talk about when to avoid using certain monsters. Um, now, I should preface the video by saying this is all sort of general advice for mapping. Obviously, you know, uh, once you get to a point where you're really confident with the monster rolls and you're really confident at using monsters in different settings and stuff, then, you know, you can go kind of nuts and put monsters into situations where normally they wouldn't work, but, you know, with, like, a little bit of purpose and direction, they can sort of function in those scenarios. But, uh, for the most part, I'll sort of give some general rules or, you know, uh, at least some good uh, things to think about when, when placing monsters. So, uh, this, this video will probably be split up into two parts, because, uh, there are a lot of monsters in Doom, and, um, Covering them all might take some time, so we'll start out with the little zombie men. Uh, so basically, they're like a they're a fodder enemy. They're a good fodder for chain gun gameplay. You know, often used as like a pistol start little monster to kill. Uh, ammo drops that add to combat. Uh, I'll talk about this a couple of times probably with the the other hit scan enemies, but um. A lot of times you'll want to sort of balance an area's ammo, and uh, you don't necessarily want to like litter items all over the ground uh, in certain situations. So stuff like zombie men, they use less ammo than they drop generally if you're killing them with a chain gun, or say you have extra shotgun ammo, you can take them out with that, and then you're getting bullets in return or whatever. Uh, shotgunners are the same. Chain gunners are generally you end up with less or the same than you get from the chain gun, but uh, zombie men and shotgun is uh, generally like a good way to sort of give bonus ammo for players running around areas, especially with chain gun spam in this case. Um, in the context of like proper arena setups, they're good for space and arm forcing quick pushing where the player So what I mean by that, uh, you can use big packs of them to take up space in a fight that uh, that the player has to push through in order to like, create their own space in the encounter. Uh, this could be with a rocket launcher, SSG, chain gun, plasma gun, whatever. Uh, for instance, Sunlust, uh, what is it? 28? Yeah, Sunlust 28. There's a little set, there's the section where you teleport in a bunch of Hell Knights insta-pop and there are two Cyber Demons on the sides and a vial in front of you. Uh, and you've got to run, sort of, you can run past all that and then you go up this uh, little ledge and there's like uh, a bunch of insta-pop zombie men that get in your way on the way to the, I think it's the BFG that you get. Um, stuff like that where it's like, okay, there's a bunch of enemies around me and behind me. Um, and now suddenly I've got to like push my way through these zombie men. They're not like super high threat, but it just gives the player like 
an extra little thing, like combat within the combat kind of thing <laughs> to deal with. Uh, so minor damage pressure and low armor situations, this is mostly applicable to like, you know, when they're used in like more of a fodder manner in incidental combat and stuff, when they're just sort of dotted around. And at the start of levels, usually, uh, useful impacts will lower difficulties to bulk out areas and encounters. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I put them in UV as well when I was making Fractured Worlds, but uh, certainly when I wanted to. Uh, like, one of the things is I think with. I'll, I think I'm going to make a, a video on difficulty settings because I do want to talk about that a little bit. But one of the things with Hey Not Too Rough, Hurt Me Plenty is you generally want to, like, pad out areas where difficulty has been lowered from ultraviolence so say on ultraviolence i take out like some mid tier enemies or something each area that you build you kind of have like a set time that you want the player to spend in the space or like what you think you know your map length should be and then what you think each area how long that should take kind of thing so for hey not too rough and stuff um it's a good idea to like pad out those areas if the difficulty is lower by putting in lower tier like fodder around so that the player has something to do and like giving the player something to do also for hey not too rough is good because i think players who play on lower difficulties tend to want to sort of run and gun a lot more and uh have a looser combat to deal with so zombie men are good in that scenario um uh, often used with vials, so this is a more specific example, they're often used with vials as resurrection bait to force the player to manage vial aggro resurrection animations. So, uh, in this particular scenario, you're going to have uh, an arch vial or two in amongst a pack of zombie men. Now, the player can kill the zombie men extremely quickly with pretty much any gun. I feel like this is usually for rocket launcher, plasma gun, that kind of thing but it can be used with SSG as well. Um, I think the final fight of SF2012 map 30 has a really, well not the final fight, but I think it's just before the final fight, has a really big version of this encounter. And there's a Sunlust map that does it as well. Uh, there's a map like, I don't even want to say because I'll probably get it wrong. Maybe it's like 16 or something. It's somewhere in that area. Uh, might be a bit earlier. But basically, the concept is you can kill the zombie men really quickly, and that is going to make the vials automatically resurrect as they run over the corpses, because there are so many corpses in front of the vials. So it, it makes for an interesting encounter in that, you know, you kill these zombie men in front in order to force the vials to resurrect, and then you can get free shots on the vials. Uh, and then when you shoot the vials, they're fairly likely to like retaliate and attack you. So you got to manage your cover. You have to manage space because there are zombie men filling up the area and getting resurrected really quickly. And you got to manage the arch vial aggro and stuff. So for a more specific example, that's kind of an interesting way you can use zombie men sometimes. Uh, generally avoid using not too many for this one. Uh, as a main threat, Endless difficulty is really low, I suppose is the main one. So you don't want to be using zombie men really as like your main enemy in a level because it's, they don't really produce a lot of threat by themselves uh, and they don't really promote very interesting gameplay. I put this as a joke here. <laughs> Are we done with the packs of 10k zombies? This is like a bit of a, I don't know, a trope at this point of like meme slaughter stuff. Uh, you know, like putting like a thousand fucking zombie men in a room that you blast through. Like it, it can be fun, but and you know, in tandem with vials and other enemies, it can also um, you know, it can be okay combat wise. But definitely, personally, a bit tired of seeing it because a lot of the time it, it just feels like busy work, kind of clearing through all these zombie men. Uh, I'm not sure if I forgot anything here. I mean. I would say, yeah, like using them as your main monster uh, throughout a level is probably the main time to not use zombie men kind of thing. And like the main threat in encounters, similarly, like uh, specific combat encounters and stuff, you, you don't really want them to be um, 
sort of, the, I guess, like, a singular threat. You don't want to have, like, fucking two zombie men in an encounter or something as your main threat, because, you know, it's not really going to do much for the player game progress. Uh, Alright. We'll move on to shotgun. So, much higher damage fodder than zombie men. Much scarier, in general. Uh, good uses are a higher small damage monster often fills the role more in Doom 1 maps where Revenants are absent. So Doom 1's like lack of uh, mid-tier monsters really means that the shotgunner is used a lot more. Like it's a much more prominent feature of maps, especially maps that are trying to be difficult. So it can be used in uh, Doom 1 maps as like a high threat, you know, monster because if it's <coughs> it's very high damage rolls. Um, can be used as a priority threat in low armor situations. So good for encounters early on in levels where you know the player doesn't have much armor, and uh, you want something that the player needs to sort of take out right at the beginning of a fight, which goes for most hit scan. Uh, zombie men have like really poor accuracy with their weapon so they tend to be not as a not they can't really be used as well in that scenario even in low armor situations because they're so inaccurate <laughs> that even then it makes it difficult for them to actually sort of produce any real threat uh good for an ammo drop just like the zombie man much more useful in general uh because, you know, they give ammo for the SSG and the shotgun. So, generally, you know, you can kill a shotgun easily with a chain gun, and they're going to drop you ammo for better weapons, essentially. Uh, good as a turret, sometimes. Should have put a big old sometimes brackets here. Uh, just because far away turret shotgunners are incredibly irritating. Uh, if the player can't hit them easily. So, generally avoid using uh, low cover situations, especially if armor is low. This is applicable to chain gunners, you know, all hit scan enemies. There isn't good enough cover for shotgunners. Uh, it's, it's especially bad, honestly. I haven't really mentioned it here, but they have a, dam a very big uh, range of damage. I can't remember the low end, but the high end is 45. So if you have low armor, they're almost taking half your health with a shot if they hit that high roll. So um, you need to be really careful with how you use shotgunners. It's definitely one of the enemies I use least. I use it a couple of times in my maps, but um, I use it. Uh, I use them very infrequently because that damage roll is like a very RNG uh, kind of aspect to any encounter, like. Getting blasted <laughs> for 45 damage. It, it, for one thing, it can be instant. There's not a lot of animation wind up for them. Uh, and if So if you don't have cover, uh, you're just going to get popped. And even if you pop out from behind cover, there's a chance that they're going to instantly shoot you anyway. And having a high damage roll like that, that's unavoidable, uh, is really problematic. Especially if you're trying to balance an encounter to be like consistently beatable difficult to shoot snipers covered that a little bit um there's a <laughs> what's that slaughter first map is it slaughtenstein is that what it's called the the massive um uh it's a massive castle map where you run around the outer walls and then end up in the center of the building i think it's called slaughtenstein or something uh, but that map has a ton of really annoying to hit shotgunners that uh, that snipe you from up on the castle walls, and yeah, it's incredibly painful to deal with because uh, they can still roll quite high damage even from that range. Uh, and traps with damage is mostly unavoidable in the lowest surrounding chain gunners. This applies to chain gunners too, obviously, which I'll touch on. Uh, Really insta lower floor traps into circles of mobs are generally like problematic in and of themselves from a design perspective, but shotgunners are especially bad. Like <laughs> you're thinking about that forty five damage roll, right? Let's say now you got two shotgunners and they both hit a high damage roll in a row, which is possible. That's ninety damage instantly that's unavoidable. 
Uh, <laughs> so, like, you know, suddenly you have three shotgunners, and you have an insta-kill scenario, potentially, especially with, like, a drop-down. So, you have to be really careful with shotgunners. They're definitely difficult to use. Uh, I didn't really put this here, but, uh, you know, also quite good paired with vials. Uh, chain gunners, too, they're, they're good paired with vials. Um... I think uh, I think most hit scan kind of is because they're very quick to kill, and you know they proc that resurrection uh, resurrection animation. Uh, so I yeah, talked about that chain gunner. Okay, I didn't put a lot here for <laughs> when to use, but there are more scenarios in this. Uh, high priority target in most situations. So for slaughter scenarios you want to use chain gunners as if they're an arch file like a low level arch file or a low level revenant kind of thing they are like one of your highest priority targets uh in situations like that um so yeah i suppose good interchangeably with those types of enemies so uh I don't know whether to put this in like the difficulty setting video instead, but like this makes them like a good switch out for revenants in tower positions and, and vials as well on lower difficulty settings. Because while they don't do exactly the same thing, they produce a similar amount of threat and they have a similar amount of priority for targeting in fights. So yeah, good as a sniper slash turret. I think most people will tend to use them this way. I should also put, you know, uh, good, good with arch files. I'll add that in as I go. On professional stream. Um, uh, good with our trials in situations where they can be multiple times. Misspelling of resurrected there. Very embarrassing. Double S instead of the single S. I think I get so used to res as a thing instead of resurrection that I never write this word anymore. Uh, so that's my excuse. Um, <laughs> anyway, so what I mean by this, uh, you know, like Plutonia style uh, vial sitting behind them, the, the concept behind it being that sort of bringing back the threat over and over again to the chain gunner so that the vial because the vial is your primary target, you want to get to the vial, but the chain gunner is stopping you getting from the vial. And the chain gunner is also a high priority threat. So you have these two very high priority threats sort of trading off over and over while it's resurrecting. Uh, and, and, you know, it can make for interesting scenarios, especially when you have, like, other parts of combat that are distracting you from dealing with that all the time. So like you go and kill the chain gunner, but then you have to go and deal with something else and then he gets resurrected and you can only get like a couple of shots on the vial with rockets or something. There's like a good amount of trading off uh, of threat priority in, in combat scenarios when you uh, have that kind of thing going on. Uh, generally avoid for chain gunners. Uh, low cover situations is the big one and especially farms low. This is just copy pasta, difficult to shoot snipers. Yep, all the same stuff as shotgun guys, essentially. Uh, I would also maybe add, uh, it f I feel like it shouldn't need to be said, but in situations where you only have the pistol and in situations where you only have the single shotgun and you need to push through the chain gunner in, either, in order to progress through to the next area because chain gunners are a little bit inconsistent in terms of whether they're going to die to that single shotgun blast. And I feel like, uh, you know, for consistency's sake, you know, maybe better to not have those situations where it's possible for you to, like, tank big amounts of damage because your first... Uh, Shotgun blast didn't kill them. Uh, in situations where they're likely to cause infighting, they will nullify other monsters. Uh, hitting other monsters that can't hit the back, hitting fire monsters that will miss them. So, let's say you have a chain gunner up on like a podium or, you know, a ledge, whatever. Uh, because, he's, because they're uh, a hit scan enemy, they can hit projectile monsters at angles uh, down and up that the projectile monster can't hit them from. So you could end up with a situation where, like, let's say you have 
this chain gunner on this podium in the middle of a room. He can shoot down at an angle at the player. Then you got like a bunch of hell knights that chase the player around the room. Uh, the chain gunner hits those hell knights and they start infighting the chain gunner. But they do, because of their AI, they path towards the chain gunner and they end up clumping around the podium and sort of just sticking to that podium and they can never kill the chain gunner. And that sort of ends up like completely nullifying the threat of the hell knights because they're never going to stop infighting because they can't kill him. Uh, at least until the chain gunner dies, like, either you kill him or whatever. But, uh, situations like that where, because they have such a high rate of fire and they're very likely to hit other monsters due to the spread of the chain gun, you want to be careful about, uh, what angles they can hit enemies from and whether it's gonna sort of nullify threats in, in fights or in incidental scenarios too, if they can hit monsters through windows across the map. Uh, things like that could cause problems because like let's say you have a cyber demon right but like fucking across the map there's a chain gunner and he can just barely shoot through your window to where the cyber demon is uh, the player can just get that chain gunner to hit the cyber demon one time and it'll cause infighting AI for the cyber demon <laughs> and then that cyber demon does nothing he just walks around the room forever he'll never hit that chain gunner so yeah, uh, little thing to consider, a bit of a more specific scenario for chain gunners. Alright, imps. Uh, good low health fodder. Enemy that's like generally just good in all scenarios, like as a low health monster anyway. Uh, low health area denial in large groups, so big pack of imps in a slaughter encounter is really good to have to make... Uh, the player have to kind of push through them and create their own space because they die easily they also die consistently they're not like demons that have high enough health where an ssg blast or a rocket if they glance them can potentially not kill them uh they generally die when you expect them to die for the most part uh good as a starting monster for slow building encounters wave encounters longer fights etc so you know Good starting monster for, like, uh, in that last video, when I talked about encounter design and I talked about that uh, blue key fight in map three of Fractured Worlds, I start with, um, I start with the imps in order to build the gimmick slowly. So you start with an easier version of the fight and then the revenants come in and that's the harder version of the same fight kind of thing. So imps are good if you have like a longer fight or or something like that and you want to start off here's like your initial threat for the player, get them used to moving around the space, things like that, and then um, you know, you can build on that fight and make it more difficult. Also, it's not really here, but maybe it felt a bit self explanatory. They're good as just like general they're good as general like uh monsters to place around areas like for incidental combat and stuff they're easy to dodge low health so good for sort of padding out play space and and play time in areas um uh, good as like low health sort of easy to avoid turrets uh things like that not super high pressure uh so decent, this is a more specific example, a decent for infighting and encounters where aggro switching helps to pressure the player. So what I mean by this is, say you have a cyber demon, he's fighting a pack of imps. Uh, the cyber demon is going to switch targets regularly as he kills the imps because because uh, they die so fast. So you have a cyber demon and a pack of imps. You're sort of moving around this encounter. Cyber demon is going to kill these imps pretty quickly. Then he's going to switch aggro back to you uh, as soon as he's killed those imps if he doesn't get hit again. So it means that, you know, there's a bit more management in terms of aggro than with, like, barons because a cyber demon, you know, he takes six rockets to kill a baron. So he's going to be stuck aggroed on that baron for quite a while. Whereas the imps, you know, you have to watch the cyber demon because at any point he could switch aggro back to you and, and kill you. Uh... 
Encounters where you specifically want him to weaken something or distract it but not kill it. Uh, usually applicable to cybers. Yeah, so... I guess... Uh, it's sort of a similar concept of having, like... They distract something like a cyber demon for a certain amount of time in the fight. They give you, like, a little bit of leeway, but they're not going to out now kill the cyber demon for you like a group of barons or hell knights might. I mean, unless you're dealing with, like, you know, 500 imps or something. Generally avoid using... Uh, yeah, so... While they're good in most situations, much like zombie men, not that interesting as a main threat in encounters, unless in very large numbers or very tight spaces. I feel like I didn't really emphasize... Oh, I, I missed it, because I'm a dumb. I am a dumb. Okay, they're really good for enforcing rocket or SSG pushing in encounters. And what I mean by this is... You could have like a really massive pack of imps, like a thousand imps. Give the player a rocket launcher and he can... Uh, he... Uh, you know, the player can push through those imps. Uh, by just sort of firing rockets into the pack, and through movement, you can just sort of constantly fire and push your way through. Uh, and it's like a, it's just a more interesting way of making the player deal with area denial, I suppose. So like these imps take up all this space, but the player has this option now to like push through. But it's more interesting than just sort of standing in one spot and killing all the imps, and then you've got more space. Instead, he, like, the player has to like push through this big wave of imps and then make it to the other side, and then maybe there's health on the other side or more ammo or a different scenario to deal with or something like that. And this goes for, on a smaller scale, like doing the same thing with the SSG. So you can have um player enters a room, a couple of teleporters with imps, they're slowly filling the room, and you have to like wipe these imps out with SSG as they're coming in. That's quite a common encounter. And uh, a good use of imps. Because uh, low pressure and low numbers, but once they fill up a space, obviously, you know, they're going to scratch you to death pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say there are too many scenarios when avoiding using imps. Uh, at least, like, in terms of their role as a monster. Like, you can basically use them whenever you want, as long as you're actually, like, you know, thinking about what the scenario is that you want to use them in. Uh, pinkies. Now, pinkies are a lot more specialized, I suppose. They're higher level fodder, better in large amounts when SSG is available. Uh, you don't really want to be shotgunning, like single shotgunning down a bunch of pinkies. Um, creates pressure for the player to move or push through in tight encounters, so... Mainly, uh, I'll tie this into the other one, mainly a space threat and large scale encounters. Often as a way to force a player to clear pinky packs to gain movement options. So, pretty much functions the same in small encounters. Uh, they're fast and they take up like quite a bit of space. And they're sort of mildly tanky. They require an SSG shot to kill, a rocket to kill, that kind of thing. So, it means that, like, you know, player enters a space. Wall lowers, three pinkies start running at you, and then you've got other monsters behind them. You have to deal with these pinkies first because they're going to come in and they're going to pressure you, take up space, and they do quite a lot of damage. I think they're also 45 damage uh, as a max roll, I want to say. Maybe it's even slightly more, but... Um, Mainly, yeah, mainly a space threat, I suppose. In large-scale encounters, it's sort of the same thing as imps, but um, because they move a lot faster, the space they take up uh, is different in the sense that it's much higher pressure. Like, the space... Uh, the space denial that they produce moves a lot more towards the player than imps, who tend to kind of meander around a little bit more and... Uh, it's not quite as difficult to deal with. The other problem with pinkies is that um, this, they're, yeah, here, yeah. good as a rocket launcher denial tool. Really hard to kill pinkies without taking splash in small areas because of how quickly they move and slightly bigger hitboxes and things like that. So it means that, like, 
in a large scale slaughter encounter, if you have a big pack of pinkies that you want to run at the player, not only are they going to take up space, they're going to deny the player the use of the rocket launcher, which obviously in big encounters where you're dealing with packs of enemies is pretty much the weapon you want, unless you have tons of BFG ammo. So denying the player that as like a as a tool, if they don't clear the pinkies efficiently or, or well enough before they get to them, is um, is a good way to use them. Useless part of Berserk and Chancer encounters. So this is often the case, you know, the classic pick up a Berserk, a bunch of pinkies attack you kind of thing. <clears throat> this sort of works in incidental stuff and also larger scale encounters. So I guess for Berserk encounters, they, they work as a way to let the player know you can save ammo here, you know, like, uh, you can use that berserk we gave you and you can save like a little bit of ammo by killing these pinkies, uh, with berserk or chainsaw or whatever. Uh, Goober Vaz's resurrection threat in tight spaces, continual space management. So I, uh, there's one particular fight, the start of map five of Fractured Worlds that uses this. It's just one arch vial and maybe like 10 pinkies or something. And it's like quite a small space with like a little bit of cover. And you have to kind of use strafe and kill these pinkies. And then the vial is kind of resurrecting them. It's a simple fight, but I really like it because it's two monsters that don't necessarily get a lot of playtime together in uh, slaughter scenarios. And um, it's very simple in its concept, you know, it's just space denial, like <laughs> it's space management. You got to kill the pinkies, you know, you have a super shotgun only, you got to kill these pinkies and you got to kill that vial as quickly as possible. Here's your priority, the pinkies take up a lot of space, so they block you from getting to your priority target. He's resurrecting the pinkies, so that's causing it to be blocked over and over again. Uh, you know, and they're not, they're not going to go down like, you know, it requires that full SSG blast, sometimes two if you're unlucky to kill them, so, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of space management required for a fight like that, and it, it can be quite interesting. Good as an immobilizer against Cyber's Masterminds. You know, I put this down as a positive, this is also something to think about as a negative. Um, they're good at getting monsters stuck, like big monsters, Cybers and Masterminds. So this can be like a good thing if you want your encounter to do that. Uh, if I, I'll put potentially, <laughs> potentially negative, uh, just for when I put the slides below the video, for when people are reading this in that context. Um, yeah, it can be good in encounters, you know, maybe to, you want your mastermind to have a certain amount of threat, but you want the player to be able to like, pull his, like the, or her fire into all of the pinkies uh, and then tr and then those pinkies get aggroed and they get the mastermind stuck and kill it kind of thing like maybe that's what you want for your encounter but something to note if you're going to put cyber demons and masterminds with pinkies is that this can happen quite frequently is them surrounding the monster and, and just killing it from like 100 to 0 so something to note uh Generally avoid using in situations where infinite height will cause self-rocketing deep pits, etc. Uh, very common for pinkies to just be in pits. Uh, this ties into this one. Tossed in pits and nukage because that's where they go. You see this a shit ton. Like, people are like, man, in the Iwoods, pinkies live. The law is, pinkies live in nukage pits. It's part of their law. And I intend to respect that as a doom mapper. And so, as a protector of the coveted Doom War, I will put my Pinkies and Spectres in Yukich Pits, and only in Yukich Pits. And I'm here to tell you, you don't need to do that. Because, generally speaking, combat-wise, it's pretty fucking boring. <laughs> Not all the time, sometimes it works. I did it in Fractured Worlds at the beginning, but they're there because when you fall in... They're creating extra pressure from all the other threats that are around you, you know. They're not just in the pit because it's a nukage pit. They're there because they take up space in that area and, and you know, they cause some pressure when they're running at you. Uh, they make that area less of a safe space to be in, etc. 
I'm not just putting them in there because, you know, Pinky's live in Yukich, so try not to do that. Uh, and the self-rocketing thing is quite prevalent in these scenarios. Uh, so yeah, just be wary of that because infinite height is going to lock onto the pinky sometimes and you're going to, you're going to really annoy people if there aren't a lot of, uh, aiming options across the pit or whatever. Uh, in extremely tight spaces where rocket launches the main weapon are less intentional for the encounter. Yeah. So this can obviously be very obnoxious. Just think about what weapons the player has for the encounter and think about whether they're going to have to use rocket launcher in a situation where it's like completely unusable because of pinkies that are sprinting at the player. Uh, in situations where there are steep stairs because they can't go down them well uh, or up them well either. Yeah, this is something people really need to think about. Um, pinkies are really bad at going up and down stairs. I, I think it's because their movement speed uh, just the way their AI seems to work, they seem to move left to right over and over again constantly, and they're very fast. And combine that with the fact that they're a bit larger than like a Vial or a Revenant, for some reason it makes them really bad at getting down, uh, getting down stairs, especially small stairs. Um, so, if you're going to put stairs in and you want pinkies, the stairs have to be quite big. I think generally 16, I want to say 16 height. might be your maximum. I'm not sure how they cope with 24 height. Um, but yeah, I would look at 16 height differentials and you want uh, quite wide stairs, like maybe 192 width or something like that. They can probably get down 128, I would imagine as well. Yeah, 128 by 16 should be fine for pinkies. But you know, tight, small staircases, they're, they're really going to struggle with or not be able to get down at all. And then you're going to have situations where they're blocking areas because they can't get down the stairs or, you know, there's zero threat or, or whatever. Uh, and that goes for the nukage pit thing too. Like, a lot of the time in a nukage pit, they're completely useless. Like, they they don't actually cause any threat or anything like that. Especially if, if it's an insta-death pit or something anyway, and then you just got pinkies down there for no reason. Just uh, be discerning when you decide to follow the Doom War. Um, okay, Spectre. Mostly used in the same situation as Pinkies. And that's, again, something you're going to have to like figure out. When should I use Spectres? When should I use Pinkies? Uh, mainly used for their surprise factor, for better or worse. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you want to use a Spectre versus a Pinky when visibility is actually a concern, but you don't, you don't really want visibility to be such a concern that Spectres are like incredibly annoying because you don't really want to be in a scenario where they're, um, the fact that they're difficult to see is so bad that they're like almost, that they're like basically invisible because I mean, that just isn't really fun. Use in tandem with light goggles to replicate the best fight in SF2012, map 7. Uh, SF2012 map 7 is a little bit notorious as like a bit of a meme map. Uh, but, in my opinion, it does have one saving grace. And that's, there's a part where, I mean, the part itself isn't very good. But you have to kill a shitload of specters in a big open area. And there's light aim goggles as a pickup, and they're actually useful because they let you see the specters. Because rocket launcher is your main weapon for this scenario, <clears throat> and I'm going to urge people to do some light aim goggles specter rocket fights. That's all I'm saying because I think it is actually like kind of interesting. I should do a whole video on light aim goggles and why they blow though. It would be one point. Uh, it would be a 10 second video, and it would say. They completely obliterate the aesthetics of your map, so never use them. But having said that, do use them for this. Just one time. Generally avoid using in very low light situations where rocket launcher is the main weapon. Intentionality, again, is important, but this is generally just irritating, yeah. So, you know, maybe you're a, a doom mapping god, and you know exactly why you want to use these specters in this way. That's totally fine, obviously. Um... These are just sort of general things to adhere to, especially if you're like a newer mapper. 
uh, <laughs> low light situations with spectres and a rocket launcher, pretty horrible scenario. Uh, I guess I should say for both Pectors, Pectors and Spinkies, um, Spectres and Pinkies is, you know, try not to use them in situations where they have zero threat. And this is like, you know, when they're stuck on stairs, <laughs> when they can't reach the player to get into melee range in any scenario, just do not bother using them. Because there ain't no point. Um. Uh, often avoided because of its appearance in different ports. This is for Spectres, sorry. Uh, so the visibility between GL and software rendering uh, is already quite a big difference, and it's different from vanilla again. Realistically, I guess software rendering is obviously for PR Boom Plus and things like that is pretty similar to vanilla uh, visibility. GZ Doom is different again. I think they're more visible in GZ Doom than even in GL. Well, I'm talking about GZ Doom GL because people generally don't use software in that port. But, um, yeah. Uh, I, I think they're more visible in GZ Doom than they are in GL Boom and PR Boom. And then DSDA, I don't, I don't know if it ended up being exactly the same as PR Boom Plus in terms of visibility for software mode. But, um, Just, uh, I think there was at least one version of DSDA Doom where the Spectres were even less visible potentially than our software for PRB Plus. And also user settings, you know, things like gamma, monitor brightness, all these things with this monster tend to affect how people will deal with it. It's gonna be more difficult for someone playing on a much darker monitor with like default gamma and stuff in software mode that someone in max gamma with GL. And you know, speedrunners will often play in GL max gamma because it's much easier to see and often, you know, specifically helps with spectres and things like that. So it's one of the most, spectres are probably one of the least useful monsters in Doom. Uh, a, they perform pretty much exactly the same as pinkies and B, a lot of their difficulty comes down to user settings, which is kind of stupid. So, you know, think about that if you want to use them. Uh, all right, Kaka Demon, uh, what is it good for? Kaka Swarms, uh, and just to talk about the purpose of a Kaka Swarm a little bit. Slow map pressure base encounters that revolve around the Kaka Demon's occupation of space by infinite height and ability to traverse most geometry. So. Uh, you know, I'll talk about this, I suppose. If you think about, uh, Sunlust Map 20 and the Kakos form that's in that, they sort of slowly pour out of this cave space. Uh, and because of the design of the map, because it's sort of a bunch of elevated spaces, um, that the player can't traverse due to not being able to get up and over obstacles, it means that the Kakademons can move around through spaces that the player can't, and they can come at the player from angles that the player uh, won't necessarily expect because they can't move that way themselves. So the Kako Swarm here works quite well. Um, also, the nature of the space, how much space there is, uh, the fact that it's in tandem with uh, Cyber Demons that can invite them from behind. So there's like a lot of management going on in that fight. Um, and I suppose maybe I should have put this in generally avoid using. <laughs> Did I talk about it? Let's see. No. Because uh, I should, I'll put that in after, but. Kako swarms where there is no threat to the swarm itself. Don't, don't use them for that. And what I mean by that is don't use them as like, you know, a big wall opens and a big swarm of Cacodemons comes out. But that's the only threat and you have a rocket launcher and you have like infinite space behind you. So you're just like their projectiles are extremely slow and easy to avoid. And the monster doesn't move as, that quickly itself. So if you don't have like an area with interesting verticality and interesting angles they can come from, 
uh, you're basically just putting an imp on the ground that has more HP. Um, so they should realistically be used in scenarios where their ability to access, um, you know, different vertical spaces is actually utilized. Otherwise, they're, they're kind of pointless. Um, they're good used as spectacles, so like Breathless, Big Cacker Swarms. Um, I used them in Breathless Finale as like a, just a big spectacle set piece kind of thing. And, you know, they can be used that way uh, just for aesthetic purposes sometimes. Obviously, they were there to create, you know, pressure of various kinds during the actual fight itself, but, you know, uh, creating pressure over geometry. Yeah, so I touched on that, that ground monsters can't physically pressure pits and stuff. Um, I did touch on that a little bit, but, um, you know, obviously you have, like, a bunch of walkways separated by pits. Only flying monsters are really going to be able to create good pressure on those. Um, because other monsters probably won't be able to traverse the environment in interesting enough ways or, or be able to get to the player properly. So that's usually sort of the main purpose of flying mobs and, and cacodemons. Good as meteor imps. Uh, I just said they were bad as meteor imps. <laughs> so we'll put, let's put a in brackets sometimes. In Doom 1, they're obviously used this way a lot. I feel like they're not actually used for their verticality all that much in Doom 1. Um, and they can sometimes be good as, like, a middle ground between an Imp and a Hell Knight, uh, in incidental scenarios. But I would say don't use them that way too, too much. Uh, creates map pressure due to unrestricted movement. Yeah, yeah, so, this is what I was saying. But, uh, talking about it in terms of Sunlust 20, that's obviously more of, like, a strict combat scenario. But for incidental maps... It's a bit different, right? Because you're flowing through a space. Uh, you're going to have a lot more interconnected areas, most likely. So you can have cacodemons that teleport in at one side of the map and they slowly move their way through the map to meet the player. Or, you know, they just follow the player through the map and then he comes across them. You know, they come across the enemies at like a, a different time. So you can kind of create these interesting timings for encounters with cacodemons and, and other flying mobs where you can place them in a space and you just let the AI kind of follow the player uh, when it, you know, and they'll sort of meet the player at a random interval. So there's kind of an interesting usage of them in incidental maps. Uh... And, you know, this kind of pressure, you know, you can have, like, four Cacodemons that follow the player from early on in the map when the player can't deal with it, and then they can just follow the player throughout the map. And it's, like, a, a sort of slightly different pressure to non-fly monsters that maybe can't get around uh, maps that easily. Um, so generally, avoid using. In large amounts, when only a single shotgun or chain gun is available, this is applicable to most mid-tier monsters. Uh, yes, it is uh, really applicable to everything in Doom is, maybe I should have put this in my encounter design video or something. Don't, my general advice would be, don't design an encounter <laughs> and then, uh, okay, don't design an encounter that is fun with a rocket launcher and a chore with an SSG and give the player only the SSG. That's what I would say. A lot of difficult... Uh, people trying to make difficult stuff will often do this and I find myself in a situation where I'm playing a fight and... I'm like, wow, I really wish I had a rocket launcher for this fight. It would be a lot of fun with a rocket launcher. And instead I have a super shotgun. And I'm having to kill, like, you know, six manks and ten cacodemons and all this stuff. Just give me the rocket launcher, man. Like, just put put fun, uh, <laughs> you know, put fun up there as one of the important factors along with challenge. Um, and I think it's like a bit of a 
you know, like an easy way out in terms of like, oh, I want to make this fight hard, I'll just make it designed for a higher tier weapon and give you a lower tier weapon, which I personally, I don't think it's a great way to do it. And, uh, hold on. You'll be glad to know I muted my mic for, for drinking purposes this time. <clears throat> but yeah, this goes for, you know, uh, any monster, I guess, as well, in incidental scenarios. Like, don't use them in large amounts when you have, like, a tier below the weapon that would be fun to clear them with. Uh, don't use them in repetitive teleport traps for two to three cacodemons are the only threat. So, happens a lot in incidental uh, maps where... I guess because they can be placed kind of anywhere and still get to the player. Yeah, you tend to run into a lot of situations where, like, you've got a single shotgun. And a couple of times throughout the map, like, two cacodemons will attack you. <laughs> and you just have to plink them down with a single shotgun or whatever. And it's not very interesting combat-wise because they're easy to dodge. They're not very high threat. And cacodemons take quite a lot of shotgun shots to kill. Even SSG is, like, two to three, so... Uh... Think about how much time the player is spending and like what they're spending it on. Um, if I'm doing, you know, two to three shotgun shots or two to three super shotgun shots, it's like, I don't know, what is that, like 10 seconds of my life? And two cacodemons is 20 seconds. I'm now shooting these things. And during that period of time, I'm not being threatened or challenged or... Uh, or anything, you know, so, I don't know. Just think about, like, okay, in this 20 seconds, what is the player actually experiencing? And if the answer is not a lot, then maybe reconsider it. Uh, in situations where infinite high would make the encounter unplayable, yeah. This is an important one. Especially for you GZ, GZ Doomers out there who make maps for Boom and test in GZ Doom. If you're going to make maps for Boom or limit removing ports in general, uh, you know, anything that doesn't have a thing to remove infinite height, then you got to think about infinite height. Uh, and scenarios where cacodemons are going to completely fill up a space, and their infinite height is going to make it that players can't move at all, um, that's something you should obviously consider and not do, preferably. Uh, okay. So I think we'll do Lost Soul and Pain Elemental, and I'll finish this up here, and then I will do a part two with the rest of the monsters. So all the interesting monsters are going to be in the second video. Uh, <laughs> and I've covered all of the boring shit tier monsters in this one. So, uh, more fool you if you watch this entire video, to be honest. Uh, so Lost Souls, uh, good as low level fodder. Uh, I would say, I'll probably talk about it in the avoid. I'm sure I mentioned it, but yeah. Using them as, like, singular fodder, like they are in, um, in Doom 1 a lot, is really not that fun, especially if you only have a single shotgun, because, uh, they take too many shots, they have too much health, uh, for what they are, for the most part. If you have an SSG, it's kind of okay, but, uh, they're not even really that interesting to fight as a singular monster. Uh, good in large packs for unique pressure situations and spectacle. Uh, abandoned map 10 is the example I used here. Uh, I guess, you know, in tandem with pain elementals, you can think about some last 30 final fight, something like that. But I guess we're talking about singular lost soul things here. Benjo likes to use lost souls a bit more than other people, I think, and abandoned map 10 does a really good job with just using a, a metric shit ton of them to put loads of pressure on the player. They do put a lot of pressure in massive packs. Um, they're also good uh, to pressure, like, because of, the, like, you know, they can move through smaller spaces than a Cacodemon. So they can actually get through into tighter areas where the player might be. So they're good uh, at pressuring that way. Um, and because they have verticality, obviously. Uh, they're also the fastest moving flying monster because of their launch. Uh, so they create kind of an interesting rhythm 
in terms of their pressure. If you think about Swim with the Whales Map 3, final fight, the big well of Lost Souls, <laughs> where they're teleporting in constantly and you've got all these cyber demons roaming around, they create like a really interesting sense of pressure. You know, it feels like there's an infinite amount of them pouring out of this well. and It's like, they're irritating. Uh, like, you know, they're usually just kind of a minor irritant, but, but in this situation, they're actually a real problem. Uh, they're also uh, they're also good in situations for, like, blocking... Uh, hold on, let me add this, actually, because I, I forgot to put it on here. Good for blocking rocket launcher use. I think I capitalized all the weapons. Let's keep it, you know, style guide. Let's follow the style guide. Uh, so they're good for blocking rocket launcher use. Also, this could be a negative, right? So, in some scenarios, you've got to think about the fact that uh, it's going to be really irritating for the player if you have too many lost souls in a situation where you just have rocket launcher. Which I think I talk about in the panel with the slide. But, um, yeah. Because of <laughs> the way they move, they launch across the screen. Even if they miss, they can fly right in front of your camera and, and you can blow yourself up. So... Uh, they're kind of interesting in rocket launcher scenarios. That's why in each UM8 they have lost souls around, pretty much, because you only have the rocket launcher. Um, helps to pad out pain elemental encounters if placed individually, yeah. So, you got a pain elemental in a room, you can put a couple of extra lost souls in there with it, and then that kind of starts up the effect that the pain elemental is going to have, right? Like, then the room is like filling with lost souls even faster, because you've got like a baseline. Uh, useful as a blocking tool for difficulty settings. Okay, this is really specific. Um, <laughs> these are two really specific examples, and they're for boom, basically. If you make a... I mean, if you look at the maps for Fractured Worlds, I use these as a way to create different geometry elements um, for Hano Turoff and Hermie Plenty. Lost Souls don't count towards kill percentage, so you can put them in a voodoo closet off the map and it doesn't matter because it's not going to affect UV maxes or anything. Um, because the player doesn't need to kill the Lost Souls uh, for kill percent. <coughs> so basically you can block a voodoo doll uh, by putting a Lost Soul that only appears on certain difficulty settings and then to play, like the voodoo doll won't be able to move down the conveyor and activate its line triggers. And then, you know, when the lost soul is not there on Hano to Rough or Hermie Plenty or whatever, suddenly those lines get activated. So in Fractured Worlds, this is how I achieved like stuff like having extra platforms that rise to make platforming easier on lower difficulties and opening up teleporters for new kitch pits and stuff like that on lower difficulties because, uh, all because, you know, the Lost Soul doesn't count towards kill percent, so you can use it that way. Uh, similarly, for Voodoo Claws and stuff, you can use it for RNG machines. Uh, where the Lost Soul's Wandering AI is used to trigger random lines in a closet. So, because uh, of the way Lost Souls sort of move around, you can... And because they don't count towards kill percent, you can just sit them in a closet, and then you can have it sort of decide it's going to move towards whichever lines it ends up moving towards, and you can use that as a way to sort of randomly trigger events in a map, if you so want to. So these are obviously very weird scenarios, but um, good if you're doing more advanced boom stuff. Uh, trivially avoid using situations with infinite height, blah blah blah, same as Kaka demons, don't use them when uh, infinite height's going to make it so the player can't even move. Um, yeah, this is what I was talking about with Doom 1. Don't use them as... I would say generally, it's pretty dull to deal with them in individual situations, like just shooting a lost soul with a single shotgun or something. They're just not a very interesting enemy to fight <laughs> on their own. Um, so don't use them as, like, any kind of thing. Don't just place them around in rooms. I would suggest, unless, you know, you really want a lost soul in that area for whatever reason, which is totally fine. But uh, I would suggest that, like, oftentimes, um, it's not exactly going to add to the combat of the map or the area all that much, having a singular lost soul. But again, you know, intentionality, yada yada. If you really want to use them, use them. Uh, 
in large amounts surrounding platforming unless very intentional. <laughs> Man at map 10. Lol. Yes. Uh, so Man at map 10 obviously does this, but Banjo knows what he's doing when he's making maps. That's what he wants. He wants the Lost Souls to be there to make the platforming more obnoxious if you don't deal with them earlier. Uh, but I would say generally for most mappers, because of infinite height, uh, maybe this should be for Kakademons too, having them in pits, like very tall pits, where they're going to block platforming, uh, is really fucking obnoxious most of the time. Either they're above you or they're below you and they block you from platforming, so, you know, think about those scenarios uh, with flying monsters. Okay, Pen Elemental. What are they good for? Good as a high priority threat. Because you've got to stop the spread of lost souls. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is usually their main use in like slaughter encounters. They're one of the highest priority threats. Generally, Pain Elementals and Arch Vials, depending on the space, one might be a higher priority threat than the other. They're usually your two biggest threats that you need to deal with right off the bat, depending on the scenario. Um, major threat to space, especially in larger encounters or large amounts. So yeah, in larger scale encounters, uh, they usually have it more of a problem if you have a lot of them than in the small encounters because you know their threat level is entirely determined by how much of a space they can fill with lost souls. So if they don't have the space to produce lost souls, then they're not a threat at all. But if they're in a big open area, they can, you know, if especially if they're far away from the player, like the player has to run a little bit to get to them, uh, they can't poop out Lost Souls as quickly. So, uh, yeah, think about that. Uh, secondary threat. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, good in tandem, you know, with like an Arch file or, or Cyber Demon or something where it's like, Okay, that you have to deal with this archvile first, and during the time that the player is dealing with the archvile, the pain elemental is producing lost souls and, uh, you know, making a threat in its own little corner kind of thing that the player is going to have to deal with after dealing with that primary threat. So, I think that's generally when they're like at their strongest, probably as a monster, uh, when they're given a little bit of time to produce lost souls. So, yeah, good thing to consider. Avoid using Infinite Height again. I just put this for all flying monsters, so I can really nail it into people's heads to think about Infinite Height. Uh, situations where Lost Souls cannot be produced or where they'll be ineffective, so yeah. Uh, cages is probably the big one. Don't put them in cages where they can't shoot Lost Souls, obviously. Or in very tight spaces where the player can body block their Lost Soul production entirely, and less intentional, which it often is, I will say. But uh, you know, if you want the pain elemental to be the main threat in an area, then obviously don't make it super easy for the player to just stand in front of the pain elemental. Because if you can stand in front of a pain elemental, you can just completely block their ability to produce lost souls. Um, and this kind of goes for the explosion after the fact too, where they release more lost souls. <clears throat> if they're in a really tight space and the lost souls can't fly out, they'll just die. Uh, or in vanilla, they will clip into the wall. So maybe for vanilla, <laughs> I sh you know, I don't really map for vanilla, but it's something to think about for vanilla mappers is uh, there are scenarios where pain elementals can fire lost souls and they will clip into walls and be in the void, which isn't a huge deal, but it might be something you might want to think about. Uh, situations where rocket launcher is the main weapon. So again, intentionality, blah, blah. You specifically want to do this, totally fine. Uh, SF2012 map 15 does it, um, the ultimate meme, Gangnam style midi map, which I think General Rainbow Bacon made it, or somebody made it and General ba Rainbow Bacon finished it off or, or something, either way. Um, yeah, generally speaking, Pain Elemental with only the rocket launcher is a pretty painful experience. It's not particularly fun a lot of the time, just because there's, I wouldn't say RNG, but there's a bit of luck to, um, nah, it's probably not even luck really, but <laughs> it's just obnoxious, because, uh, you know, when they fight the lost all out, um, 
pretty easy to tank a rocket to the face, but it can be fun. I think SF 2012 map 15 does an okay job. Um, if you're going to do this, uh, I will say, all right, let's say this is another thing I want to talk about low cover situations where killing them is. Difficult or slow, so because pain elementals will only fire lost souls if they have line of sight of the player, if you have a situation where you cannot block line of sight, that's when pain elementals are obviously going to be uh, the most difficult to deal with because they're just producing lost souls the entire time you're looking at them. So I would say avoid using them in situations where you can't kill them quickly and you can't line of sight them. You don't want to just put a pain elemental into a big open area where the player, you know, has other threats to deal with and they can't get to this pain elemental unless there's like specific intentionality in the design of the encounter. Um, <laughs> because generally that ends up just being obnoxious. You know, I should also put actually for all flying monsters, um, I'll just put this for the pain elemental. In large open areas where uh, this is specifically bad for pain elementals, I will say. It's annoying for cacodemons and stuff. Uh, but for pain elementals, it's really bad. I think in Sunder 5. Precarious, it happens. There's a couple of pain elementals there, which I think was intentional for Gazebo. So if you didn't sort of kill them efficiently, you kind of screwed yourself over. But that's an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, you don't really want to put pain elementals in an area where, if you because like if you shoot them, they're gonna sort of get bounced away from the player, either with a rocket launcher or a super shotgun. Generally, rocket launcher is the worst. Um, and this is why, you know, often tr people making gigantic maps with big open areas with flying stuff in them, they will put extra block lines around monster block lines in their sort of big open sky spaces so that it stops flying monsters from being able to fly off into the absolute stratosphere and like never come back. Uh, it's bad for cacodemons and stuff for UV max reasons. It's bad for pain elementals, also for UV max reasons, but it's also bad because pain elementals will just keep producing lost souls in those big open spaces because uh, in like a scenario like Precarious, you can't line up sight the pain elemental consistently. He's just going to be pooping out lost souls the entire time you're running around the map. So um, yeah, definitely avoid that uh, with pain elementals if you can. Uh, yeah, and think, I guess this is more... I'll just put, think about line of sight more than anything. Because that's really what I'm getting at here is that when you use pain elementals, try to think of them a bit like an arch vial where line of sight is a priority part of the design of an area. You should be able to sort of line of sight them in order to, to deal with them correctly, I think. Um, <clears throat> all right. This is about halfway through the slides, so I'm going to stop it here, and I'm going to do a part two, <coughs> starting with the Arachnotron, and we'll go all the way through to the rest of the, the bestiary. Um, hopefully this video was useful in some way. Uh, I think talking about monster roles is kind of an important aspect of mapping for Doom. Uh, and I guess like a lot of people, like... The second half of the video covers a lot of the monsters that maybe are more interesting, especially to people making more challenging stuff, because it's all the mid and high tier monsters, but I do think people don't actually talk about the lower tier monsters very often in these terms, so, you know, it can be useful, actually, to have to have some content that kind of addresses, you know, what the fuck do you do with uh, zombie men <laughs> in a map. Um, so... Yeah, I don't know. Hopefully people get something out of this video. I'm going to do part two of this video, and then somebody suggested in the comments of the last video that I talk about aesthetics a little bit. 
So I'll probably do a video on aesthetics, uh, and then uh, potentially I might uh, do a video regarding um, difficulty settings. And that might be more of a general, like, bitch and moan session about, you know, people uh, sticking to UV so much. <laughs> but we'll see. I'll have to see how that goes. Uh, definitely losing my voice a bit after talking for an hour or so. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching. Uh, I will catch you in the next video, which will be part two of this. And then we'll cover the actual interesting monsters. Uh, JK, lol. They're all beautiful creatures created by our Lord and Savior, John Romero. Goodbye.